head to our um, series on that is based on the book of Acts. We're going through the book of Acts chapter by chapter, and we're up to Acts number Acts chapter 20, which is we're almost we're almost there. Um, you may remember the last session we did, we spoke on Acts chapter 19 and how Paul was just so successful in reaching the city of Ephesus, the capital city of Asia for Christ. And he was so successful, and, the, and those who joined with him in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that particular project, they were so successful, they, that the, everyone, it says in Acts chapter 90 verse 10, you'll see it up there on the screen, how within two years, all those living in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. It was amazing what they did. And we looked at last week how one of the reasons why we think that happened was because when Paul arrived in Ephesus, it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 1, you'll see it there on the screen as well, he found some certain disciples. And these certain disciples we looked at last week were people who God had ordained, who God had put there to help Paul to achieve that task. And he did that, or they, and they did that. And what characterizes a certain disciple, a person who God has put in a certain place to fulfill a certain task, and life would not be the same, the church would not be the same without these people. The first characteristic we, we saw was certain disciples, they have a good understanding of who God is. Number two, they are believers who are united together. And another U word, Often, quite often, they are believers who are unknown. It's usually the invisible believers who achieve a visible result. Isn't that true? The unknown believers can, can uh, achieve a result that is known far and wide because of the significance of what they've achieved. Now, we all know that if you read Acts chapter 19, how Paul had to leave. Ephesus, and he had to leave, and one of the reasons why he had to leave, well, the main reason why he had to leave was because there were some people, as it was in most cities with Paul, there were some people there who did not want him to be in, that, in, in, in Ephesus. There was a bunch of silversmiths headed up by a guy called Demetrius, who was the head of the silversmiths' school, the silversmiths' unions, if you will, and they were quite upset with Paul because as Paul was telling everybody to follow Jesus, they weren't following the, the, the idol, the goddess Diana anymore, which meant that people were buying statues of the goddess Diana from their shops, and they weren't putting them in, in prominent positions at home to worship him because to worship her because they were worshiping Jesus instead. And because of the loss of revenue that Demetrius and these other silversmiths were suffering from, they blamed Paul for that. And they kicked him out. Well, they made sure he was kicked out of the city of Ephesus. So Paul has to move on. And, he, and the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 20 how after leaving Ephesus by force, he decides to go and visit other churches that he's planted, both in Greece and Macedonia. And he ends up in his travels back at a place called Troas. And Troas is a city, a small town, on the coast of Asia, overlooking the Aegean Sea, that was the place where the man, where, where, where Paul had a vision, and he saw the man from Macedonia telling him to come and help us. It was a very, very significant. It was a very, very just. Um, it was. It was a. It was. A, it was a moment in time for Paul. Because all other doors for ministry were blocked by the Holy Spirit for him to continue something in Asia. Because God wanted him to go to Europe. And Troas, a little small you know, seaside town on the edge of Asia, on the coast of Asia, was the place where Paul's ministry changed direction. And now in Acts 20, we find him back there. And he's there for a week. And while he's been away for the past four or so years, someone else has come in and planted a church in Troas. There's a community of believers there, and they want Paul to minister. And the Bible says that he stays there for seven days. Now, I'm going to read a story about a certain incident that took place in one of those meetings where a young guy called Eutychus 
was sleeping, was in the, in the meeting, Paul preached for too long, and, and this guy, Eutychus, he fell asleep on the windowsill, and because the story, because the, the, the room was three stories up, he fell out the window. Fell out the window because he fell asleep during a sermon. I hope no one does that when I preach in this church. Luckily, we're on the ground floor, and the chance of, of, that, of somebody getting injured while they're sleeping are next to, are next to, are next to zero. But this guy, he lost his life because he fell out of the window because he fell asleep while he was preaching. I want to read the story here because there's something very, very, um, just very, very special that we need to discover in this particular passage of scripture. So you'll see on the screen we have here the the the, the passage Acts chapter twenty verses six to twelve, and it says the following: Now, after the days of unleavened bread. We sailed away from Philippi and came to them at Troas in five days, where we stayed seven days. Verse 7, And on the first of the Sabbaths, the disciples, having been assembled to break bread, being about to depart on the morrow, Paul reasoned to them, and he continued his speech until midnight. Verse 8, And there were many lights in the upper room where they were assembled. Verse 9, And a young man, a certain young man called Eutychus was sitting on the windowsill, Paul reasoning for a longer time, being overborne by sleep. He fell down the third, from the third floor and was taken up dead. Verse 10, And Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, said, Do not be terrified, for his soul is in him. Verse 11, And going up and breaking bread and tasting and conversing over a long time until daybreak, he went out thus. Verse 12, and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. That's probably one of the understatements that the Bible does give us from time to time. I think they were more than just a little comforted. I think they were overjoyed that this guy who died during one of their meetings was raised from the dead because Paul had the faith to pray for him. Now this guy, Eutychus, you know, I see him in a particular category of Christian. And you'll see on the screen, I've got a picture here where it says, and the title says, he's an on-the-edge Christian. An on-the-edge Christian. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, let me just give a, give a bit of, let me just put this meeting where this poor guy fell out the window in a bit of context. Now, this happens in my church. It probably happens in lots of churches or anywhere all over the world. People come into a meeting and if they come into and, they, and they'll find themselves a seat and if they come back to the same place the following night or the following day they will usually sit in the same place they sat in in the first time that they came that happens in my church we have different people and they have their own allocated seats what is interesting is one time a lady who was a first timer to our church she sat she sat in the seat but she didn't realize it was someone else's. And she was told in no uncertain terms to get off that seat and go and sit somewhere else. You know, so I mean, people do get offended when you take their seat, whether whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in a church situation, you know, whatever. But it is something that does cause a bit of strife when you take somebody's seat. And Eutychus, he came, he was probably in the meeting and Paul was there for seven days. There was probably a few meetings that took took place over that week, over that particular week, and he probably chose to sit on the windowsill. He sat there the first night, the second night. We don't know how when this when this incident took place, whether it was the third night or the fourth night in the series of meetings that Paul was was, was preaching. But he chose to sit not in the centre where there was a lot of room, where there was a lot of a lot of light. The Bible tells us in verse 8, but he chose to sit on the edge of the windowsill. Chose to sit on the edge of the room where, where he had access, not just to the light, but also to the darkness as well. And that's quite an interesting point that we need to that we need to um get into, into our heads. He was a guy. He was on the edge. Now What's interesting is that when I was in an airport once in a, in, a, in a city called Auckland in New Zealand, and I'd gone there to visit my parents, and, and my youngest and my middle son, Dan um, Allen, was with me. 
And I found myself walking past the bookshop in the, in the airport, and there was a book there written by a very on the on a it was all about a famous sportsman called Jerome Kino. He's an All Black for those of you who follow follow rugby union. And for some reason, I opened that book up, and where I opened that book up to, I discovered on that particular page I was I was reading for a couple of minutes that he actually attended a church, and his, where his father was the pastor of the church, but he left that church. And he, when he was 23, grew up in the church, but suddenly he left. And he was a, he was a Samoan, a lot of Christians, a lot of Samoans are Christians, and he was probably fell in that category, or maybe he was a culturally centered Samoan Pentecostal church. But when he got to the age of 23, he decided to leave, never came back again. And I thought about this, 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 this very famous sports person who probably represents a lot of young people all over the world. They've grown up in church and then suddenly they leave and they never come back. And I thought, why is that? And I thought, it's because of the preaching. That could be one reason. Some preachers are like an explosion in a mattress factory I once heard the same in Bible school. There's fluff everywhere. They can't preach to save themselves. They can't put together a decent message and people leave the place more confused than when they came. That could be one reason. Sometimes the people in a church aren't the best examples of Christianity lived out on a day-by-day -day basis. Let's be honest. Some Christians don't walk the walk. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. But I think one reason, and this is, and hear me out on this, I think one reason why a lot of people, why a lot of young people leave church today isn't because of the preaching, it isn't even because of the people. I think it's because of where they position themselves in the first place. They're on the outside looking in, rather than making their faith, the Christian faith, their own, and be on the inside looking out. Instead of being in the centre of the room where there's lots of light, where they can stay awake, they choose to position themselves on the edge of the fellowship where it's easier to look out and be distracted by the darkness outside of the of the church interesting there are those who are on the inside looking out people who are enthusiastic excited about their faith and have made jesus the center of the universe but there are those christians who are on the edge of fellowship and they're on the outside looking in they're on the edge they're on the edge christian and unfortunately when you live your life there for too long you run the risk of falling off the edge into oblivion. Now, there is a, 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 a verse, a passage in, um, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul, he knows his time is up. It's his last epistle that he writes before he knows he's going to be executed under, 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 under the Emperor Nero. And so he writes to Timothy, and he writes in 2 Timothy 4 verse 9, he says this, he says, Make haste to come to me quickly. Verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed to Thessalonica. Christians went to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. And verse 11 says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And in this passage of Scripture, we see these two categories of people represented here. There was Demas, a guy who was a close companion of Paul, but over time chose to live out his Christianity on the edge. And he chose to see things and he chose to live out his Christian life on the outside looking in. So when things got tough, he decided to leave Paul and move and he, because he got attracted by, the, by what the city of Thessalonica had to offer him. But then there's Mark, John Mark, the guy who wrote the second gospel. And he was somebody who was on the outer initially, but he had a change of heart, change of mind, and he got reconciled with Paul again, became useful for ministry, and he became somebody who was in the center of the room, so to speak, in the center of the well-lit room, on the inside 
looking out to see how we can win people to the Lord. And it's interesting, you know, that's, I think there are, but this guy Demas, he's one of the real tragic characters of the New Testament because he was a close companion to Paul, but decided to turn his back on him and leave him when things got tough. And he, he's, he's rep, this guy Demas, he's representative, representative of a lot of people who live that, their Christianity that way. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think one reason is that the reason, one reason why people choose to live on the edge as Christians, on the edge of fellowship, on the edge of, of what God is doing, is because they've made a conscious decision to do that. They might be married, they might have a family, they might have kids, they might have work commitments, and they categorize their Christianity around all those other things. And that's where the, the commitment will only take them so far because they are more committed to other areas in their life, such as their work, family, hobbies, whatever. And they made a conscious choice. But I believe this guy Eutychus was in this was in another category. Eutychus hadn't made a conscious choice, I don't think, in, in choosing to stay on the edge. Eutychus, this young guy, the reason why he was sitting on the windowsill away from everybody else, I think he was just considering where he was. I really do that. When I read this, when I read this passage, I really felt that that was where Eutychus was at. He was a young guy. You know, he, he probably wasn't a full-on born-again Christian, but he was checking things out, considering where he was. And I know that there are people I have met, and they have gone through that particular period in their own Christian walk, where they're considering where they're at, and do they want to go deeper? I know I went through that as a as a 19 year old. I remember I left I left school. I went to a Christian school. You know, of course I, I, I went I went to church, and most of my life was spent in a Christian environment. But then when I left school and started an apprenticeship as an electrician, suddenly I found myself in an environment where it was I spent more time in secular environments than I did in Christian environments, and that got me thinking about things about how people live their lives out there in the secular world? And is there a comparison to be made between secular people and Christians? And after about six months of just observing, probably subconsciously, how people outside of church live their lives, I came to the conclusion that there is a place for a person to be part of a Christian fellowship. And I decided, and I had a, I had a taste of, of God and Christian life before them, and I decided what I tasted doesn't really compare to what the world could offer me. So I chose to stay with the church. And I did that, and I'm still there today, many, many decades later. And so I really and so I decided to position myself in the center of church, where the lights were, so to speak. In, 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 in where, where there's a well-lit room, where, amen, I won't go to sleep. I chose not to position myself on the edge where there's an opportunity, where there's a possibility I might fall out the window and do some damage, but I chose to stay in the center and I haven't regretted that decision. Where you position yourself is so important in your walk with God. But I wanted to ask the question today and just observing this guy Eutychus for the next few minutes that I've got, what characterizes an on-the-edge Christian? It's the first point I discovered. On the edge Christians, they distance themselves. It says in verse 8, I've read this before, and there were many lights in the upper room where they were assembled. And verse 9 says, and the young man caught named Eutychus was sitting on the windowsill, away from everyone else. He chose them to distance himself from the centre of the meeting, choosing instead to be on the edge of the crowd instead of in the centre. And I thought about people who distance themselves. You know, it's a common trait, it's a common thing for people to do in our society for different reasons, not just in church, but outside of church as well. And I found that people who, who, who distance themselves from relationships and, and you know, they're often very, very lonely people. I'm sure you know that as well. But another thing I've noticed, with, especially in, in, in church life, that people like Eutychus who choose to live their Christianity on the edge of a fellowship instead of in the centre, they lose their focus. Let's be honest. They lose their focus. And focus 
is something that is very, very important to God. Very, very important to the Lord Jesus that we keep our focus as Christians. There's a story in John chapter 2, verses 30 to 22, where Jesus gets a bit upset with the money changers. I'm sure you've all heard the story how he got a whip and he got very angry. Well, he didn't lose his temper. Jesus never lost his temper, but he got upset with these money changers who were, you know, causing Gentiles, people who weren't allowed in the inner court of the temple, but they had to worship God in the outer courts. Unfortunately, the outer court was the place where all the money changers would buy and sell sheep, doves, goats, whatever else they were, what they were selling for, for good Jewish people to make the sacrifices with. You know, they were, they were doing all this business and those, you know, non-Jews, the Gentiles, Greeks and others who had an interest in following the Lord, but they weren't allowed to focus because of all the ruckus that was taking place in the outer court caused by these money changers buying and selling animals. So Jesus saw these poor Gentiles and how they weren't able to focus, you know, on, 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 on the Lord. They weren't, they, they weren't able to focus on worship. So what he does, he goes and turns over all the money, all the tables and gets upset with the money changers and drives them out of the temple. You see the picture up there on the screen. You know, he got a bit upset. He wasn't angry. Jesus never sinned, so he never got angry. But he was righteously upset for a just cause because people were stopped from focusing on him. And Jesus takes our ability to focus on him really seriously. So just think about it. If, you know, when you come to a church service or, or you know, you want to worship the Lord, but things are distracting you, think about what's distracting you and what can you do? Maybe you need to move away from the edge of the building and come to the center more where you can focus better on God because People who distance themselves do tend to lose their focus. On the edge Christians tend to do that. Here's the second thing I discovered about on the edge Christians. On the edge Christians do dumb things. And it says in verse 9, I've read this before, but he was a certain young man named Eutychus was sitting on the windowsill. And Paul was reasoning for a longer time, being overborne by sleep. Eutychus fell down from the third floor and was taken up dead. Basically, he fell out the window. <laughs> and him falling out the window, I believe, was a culmination of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, it was silly. Let's face it. He was a young guy, and young guys do silly things sometimes. I've done silly things, but, you know, this guy, he was on the windowsill, the window was open, he was up three stories, he was slowly nodding off, and he didn't see the tragedy coming, that he ran the risk of falling out the window. I mean, if he had any brains, please forgive me, but if he had any brains, he would have realized he was nodding off, and he would have gone and sat somewhere else away from danger. I mean, how many of us were driving our cars, and you know, we, we, we tend to get a bit sleepy behind the wheel. What's the, what's the first thing we should do? Yes, that's right. We should pull over where it's safe, have a bit of a rest, get our, get our energy levels up again, and then keep driving. That's what we should be doing. You know, but we don't do that. How many of, how many of you watch this video? You know, you've, you've spoken on your mobile phone, on your smartphone while you're driving, knowing that there's cameras all around just waiting to take a picture of you doing it. You know, dumb. Dumb. I've got a picture up here on the screen of a movie that I've heard about. I haven't actually seen it, but I've heard about it called Dumb and Dumber. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians live their life like these two guys here, Dumb and Dumber. They just do stupid things. But that's what on the edge Christianity will do for you. You know, you, you, you do dumb things because you're away from common sense, because you're, you've, you've chosen to distance yourself from other people, you know, and you're not, you're not in a place where you can receive good godly counsel. You do some dumb things. You do. And dumbness or stupidity is not confined to young people. I'll say that again. Stupidity 
is not confined to young people. There are lots of older people who also have lived out their Christianity on the edge of things, on the edge of fellowship, who have also done some dumb things as well. You know, the Bible does talk about a, a king called Uzziah, who was, it's, and it talks about him in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. He was a young guy, and he became the king of Judah at 16 years of age. And he was a really good king. And the Bible says that he reigned for 52 years as king of Judah. So 52 plus 16, that's 68 years of age, isn't it? And when he was 68 years of age, the Bible tells us he wanted to suddenly change vocations, stop being a king, well not stop being a king, but he wanted to take on priestly responsibilities and burn incense to, to, to the Lord. Now, there was a problem with that because only a priest could offer holy fire unto the Lord in those days. Other people had tried and offered unholy fire. People who were qualified to off, to offer fire to the Lord did it, and they were they were, and they were they were they were killed by God because they, they, they because that was just how it was back in the Old Testament. But this guy Uzziah, he chose. He, he thought that he was above the law. He thought he was above, you know, the, the the word of God. He thought he was above, you know, the priests, and and he said, no, no, I'm gonna light the the holy fire. It's I'm king. I'm gonna do it. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26 verse 17, shows how dumb this guy was. It says, Azariah, who was probably the main priest, went in after him. And with him, 80 priests of Jehovah, mighty men. And probably all of those 80 priests were giving you King Uzziah the same message. Don't do this. This is dumb. Stupid. But he went ahead with it lit the fire against the advice of 80, you know, good men of God. And as a result of his stupidity, he ended up being a leper for the rest of his days. And a guy who started out so well, was such a good king for the nation of Judah, finished, ended his life in tragedy, isolated from everybody else because he was leprous. A person who was dumb in his old age. You know, and I think, you know, you know, there is a, I did watch a movie once called All Saints, really great movie about, about, a, about an anchor church that, um, that was on the, on the verge of, of closing down, but things happened and the church got, got, got back into a strong position again. I'll, I'll put, the, I'll put the, um, the picture up there on the screen so you can see what movie I'm talking about. But there were, the, 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 the guy, Michael Spurlock, who was the, 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 the Episcopalian priest in that particular church in a place called Smyrna in Tennessee from memory. And he had a person, an older church member, who didn't like him, a guy called Forrest, but he needed Forrest. And the reason why he needed Forrest was because, you know, this, this, this pastor was trying to use the church grounds to run a farm. Forrest was a farmer. And the pastor didn't know how to run a farm properly, and he needed Forrest to help him. And one day, in, in, in one particular part of the movie, this guy, this guy Michael Spurlock, says to, says to Forrest, he says, "Look, Forrest, I need you to help me keep my stupid in check. I need you in my church to keep my stupid on a leash. And maybe that's the power of fellowship. Maybe that's the power of choosing not to live your life on the edge." of Christianity, on the edge of a fellowship, on the edge of a church, but when you choose to live your life where the room is well lit, away from danger, away from the window, so to speak, you know, your stupid is kept on a leash. And you don't make dumb decisions because you're in a place where you can talk to people and they will talk back to you and they will help you to keep your stupid on a leash. Amen. Here's the third thing. I discovered about on the edge Christians. Now this is encouraging, it really is. On the edge Christians don't have to stay dead. Verse 9, we read it before, but he fell down from the third floor, was taken up dead. And verse 10 of Acts 20 says, And Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, said, Do not be terrified, for his soul is in him. 
Verse 11, and going up and breaking bread and tasting and conversing over a long time until daybreak, he went out thus. Verse 12, and they brought the young men alive and they were not a little comforted. You know, sure, this young guy, Eutychus, had chosen to distance himself when he chose to sit on the windowsill. Sure, he did a stupid thing by, by falling asleep and before he fell asleep by not moving somewhere else when he realized he was nodding off. Not taking into account where he was and, and, and the danger that, 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 it, that it posed. But, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who when Eutychus suddenly just disappeared from the windowsill and fell down, I'm sure there were a few people in that particular crowd of people who were saying, oh, you silly idiot, why did you do that for? Dumb, silly. But thankfully, Paul, the preacher that night, was not one of those people. The Bible says immediately he went downstairs, laid on the bloke, and prayed that God would bring him back to life again because he believed that God was the God of the second chance. Amen? To hear an amen to that. If you do a dumb mistake as a Christian, the consequences don't have to be catastrophic. God can give you a second chance. You know, I was reflecting. I've got a picture up on the screen of the um, the prodigal son. And how he, he saw sense and came back to his father, realized that life away from dad, life away from the family wasn't as good as life with the family, back with, back with mum and dad. But you, you think about this guy, the prodigal son. He was an on-the-edge Christian, so to speak. You know, he, cho he, he lived his life in the family, on the family farm, on the outside looking in. He was there, but he really wasn't there. Let's be honest. And he was, you know, he had, an, he had an eye on the light. He had an eye on the farm. He had an eye on, on life in the center of the family. But he also had an eye on what was out there as well. So one day he comes to dad and says, Dad, give me my inheritance. I've had enough of being here. I want to see what life is like on the outside. And so the father gives him the inheritance. He walks off. And as an on-the-edge person, as, the on, as an on-the-edge Christian often does, he chose to distance himself from God and from his family. He went and he lived in a far country, chose to put distance between him and his family. And we saw that you know, he was given quite a bit of money, but he did some dumb things with it. The Bible tells us that he spent his money on frivolous things. He had a lot of Harry hangers on, hangers, hangers who were friends just because of the money. But, you know, it, was, it wasn't good. What he was doing, he was dumb. But then he realized as he was, as a famine hit the land, he had no resources anymore. And he was feeding pigs for a job, which for a Jewish person was the, was the absolute pits. That was the absolute lowest of the low. He came to his senses and he realized that he needed to get back home again and to get himself restored and to get a second chance with his, with, 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 his, with his dad and with his family. And he comes back and you'll see on the picture how the father greets him and doesn't just give him a second chance, but it gives him an honor position in the family. You know, he puts a ring on his finger, puts new clothes on him, you know, has, has a party because my son was lost and now was found and that caused division, that caused stress with, for the other brother who, who hadn't done the right, who, 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 was, who was doing the right thing all along. But really he, he, had, he had a religious legal spirit that needed to be dealt with and, and that's probably why, why Jesus told this parable in the first place, not just for the, for the lost, but for the people who had an issue with lost people coming back again, to be honest. But the prodigal son, he is an example of an on-the-edge person who, you know, chose to distance himself, chose to do dumb things, but amen, he didn't have to stay dead. That's the message of the gospel. You don't have to stay dead. But if you choose to go back to God, you choose to go back to the center of fellowship because you've fallen off the edge, amen, you can have a second chance. And probably Eutychus, that young guy, would, ne would probably never ever forgot that day 
he fell out the window. And I really believe that when it came for church, the next meeting, and maybe in the meetings in the future, he decided, I'm not going to be on the edge anymore. I know where that, that, I know where that took me, but rather I'm going to be someone who's going to be in the middle of the well-lit room, and I'm going to be a Christian who doesn't see things from the outside looking in, from the edge looking towards the centre, but I'm going to be in the centre looking out to see who else I could bring with me to heaven. So, you know, if you have been an on-the-edge Christian, amen, don't stay there. Don't stay on the edge. Get back to the centre. Amen. Don't be someone who is distant from other believers. Don't be someone who does dumb things because you've chosen to distance yourself from wise counsel from the fellowship of others. But if something has happened and you've done something dumb, amen, and maybe you, your Christianity has died a little bit, you don't have to stay dead. Amen. God is saying to you today, come home. Just as you just was raised from the dead back in Acts 20, you could be raised spiritually from the dead as well. And God can give you a new start. Amen. God bless you, may keep you, may cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And we'll see you next time when we have a look at Acts 21. Okay, God bless you. See you later. Bye.